Weight loss can be a huge struggle due to things like differences in health history and your own unique factors that are impairing your metabolism. That's one of the reasons why there's so many diets out there. Each person has to find the approach that works for them and not every approach is gonna work for every person. But when it comes to Hashimoto's and other thyroid conditions, we have an added layer of challenge. This means that our approach has to be different and we need to attend to the specific demands and needs that Hashimoto's presents us. Because of these demands, one of the biggest areas that I see people making mistakes in is with their protein intake. So in today's video, we're gonna discuss how changes in protein intake can directly impact thyroid function. And we'll also give you some parameters and goals that you can shoot for to improve your protein intake. That way you can optimize your weight loss and support your health overall. But before we get started, if you're new to the channel, welcome. My name is Dr. Brad Bodel, and I specialize in helping people use natural strategies to improve their Hashimoto's and their hypothyroid symptoms. That way they can lose weight, improve their energy, and get their old life back. If you're interested in today's topic and want to learn more about how you can help your thyroid, then don't forget to give this video a thumbs up and also subscribe to the channel. I post videos on Thursday mornings and doing those things will let you know when new content is available. But let's get right into things. And to start off, I wanted to ask you guys a question. If you have Hashimoto's or some other kind of hypothyroidism and you're trying to lose weight, what is the general recommendation? Well, it's probably the same recommendation that anyone who's trying to lose weight gets from their doctor. It's you gotta decrease the amount of food you're eating and you need to exercise more. It's our old favorite, the standard calories in versus calories out approach. But as I mentioned in the intro, if we already have thyroid dysfunction, then we need to make specific changes that are reflective of our condition. Research tells us that both food quantity and quality are one of the most important environmental factors that leads to HPT activity. HPT stands for hypothalamic pituitary thyroid axis and simply refers to the communication between our brain and our thyroid gland and the resulting production of thyroid hormone. It's all of these steps together that allows us to have a healthy metabolism. And by the way, there are many, many research papers that talk about the connection between food and our thyroid gland. So feel free to bring that up next time your doc says that diet and nutrition has nothing to do with your thyroid health. But when it comes to food quantity or the amount of calories that we're taking in, food restriction leads to a decrease in HPT activity. The cause of this is assumed to be a protective mechanism to help us save energy in cases of starvation. And this is reflected by a decrease in TRH, a decrease in TSH, and a decrease in circulating thyroid hormone levels. Now, TRH is probably one that you're not familiar with, and it stands for thyrotropin releasing hormone. The reason you haven't heard of it before is because it's not something that can be measured on our blood labs. It represents that first step in the HPT axis. Our hypothalamus, which is part of our brain, has releasing hormones that then stimulate our pituitary to release stimulating hormones into the bloodstream. So TRH is necessary for the release of TSH, which is a standard hormone that many of us have had checked and is the one that is released into the bloodstream to then stimulate thyroid hormone production. That might be a little confusing, but the main thing that you need to understand is that when we have severe caloric restriction, we see down regulation of our thyroid pathway at each step in the process. But not only does the research tell us that a decrease in food quantity can lead to decreased thyroid activity, but the composition of our food makes a huge difference as well. What do we mean by composition? Well, food composition is both about the micronutrient status of the food we're eating, how many vitamins and minerals are in it, and where are the calories coming from, meaning what is the distribution of macronutrients and how much carbohydrates, fats, and protein are in each food. But what we're most interested in today is the protein content. Decreased protein content in our food leads to a decrease in thyroid function both centrally and peripherally, meaning it affects the parts of our brain that are involved in the pathway and the actual production of thyroid hormone that then circulates our bloodstream. And these effects are similar to the ones that we would see in cases of starvation. 
This is demonstrated by looking at the levels of the hormones that are involved in suppression of thyroid activity. In the protein-restricted experiments, the level of these suppression hormones near the ones in the starvation experiments. And they are significantly higher than any of the levels that we see in the controls. Not only that, but in animal studies that looked into the matter, the test subjects that were fed a low protein diet tended to be hyperphagic and also have increased levels of adiposity, meaning that they were more hungry and tended to eat more and had higher levels of body weight. So if low protein intake can decrease our thyroid metabolism, this sounds like it could be a problem for anyone, and it is. But it's especially problematic for people with pre-existing thyroid conditions. Low protein on top of Hashimoto's can further impair our metabolism and make it more likely for us to gain weight. So what should our goals or targets be if we're looking to support thyroid healing, improve our body composition, and start getting that scale to move in the right direction? On average, the typical American gets about 12 to 16% of their daily calories from protein, which based on a 2000 calorie diet is about 60 to 80 grams per day. Now I think this number is too low, even for the average person with no underlying health conditions. And for perspective, hunter gatherer tribes that have been studied typically consume about 19 to 50% of their calories from protein which comes out to about 95 to 250 grams per day. Of course, as I've said before, I don't think we need to do everything like hunter-gatherer tribes, but I do think it informs us a little bit about our physiology, and these groups of people often are void of any type of chronic or degenerative condition. The point is, is that we're likely eating much less protein than previous generations. And when it comes to people with thyroid conditions, that demand for protein is likely even higher. Because of things like a decreased digestive capacity and absorption, and an increased demand for healing, thyroid patients are both not getting as much protein from an equivalent meal as someone without thyroid issues, and they need extra amino acids available to support their condition. Not to mention that if you have thyroid problems and you also have a significant amount of excess body weight, your protein demands could be even higher. I know this might sound backwards, but people with a larger body size actually burn more calories, and that's because more calories are required to maintain more mass. You can kind of think of it like the electricity bill or the heating bill for a large office. There's more demand and more energy required for a larger office versus a smaller one. In an effort to provide appropriate energy for these extra fat cells, there are some theories that the body will then utilize some of the protein that we're taking in from our diet and converting it into glucose via gluconeogenesis. So instead of using the protein to help rebuild, heal, and supply things like enzymes and hormones, we're now using that solely as an energy source. Therefore, if we're using the protein as energy, then we can't use it for all the things that we just listed. But if we need help in those areas, then the demand for protein remains. Again, this is just one theory, and there are competing ideas on the topic. But I do think it's something important that we should at least keep in mind as another potential reason why people with thyroid issues have a higher protein demand and why protein is so important. But just how much protein should we be including in our diet? And when it comes to my patients, I go after this in a few different ways. In an ideal situation, my general recommendation is that we eat 1.5 grams of protein for every kilogram of ideal body weight. Now remember, this is not an ironclad rule, and you might need more protein, and you might need less, but it is a good reference point. Additionally, the reason why I prefer to use ideal body weight rather than current body weight to base our measurements off of is because I found in practice that people who have excess body weight usually don't need to eat that many grams of protein to reflect their current status, and people who are underweight oftentimes need to eat more. For example, if someone is currently 300 pounds, then based off my equation, they would want to be eating around 204 grams of protein per day. Now, that's certainly not impossible or unreasonable, but if they want to support their thyroid while also helping themselves to lose weight, then it makes more sense to base that off of their ideal body weight which might be around 200 pounds. 
In that case, their target for protein intake would be about 136 grams, which will likely be easier for them to achieve and also still be supportive to their health. If a gram and a half of protein per kilogram of body weight still seems like too much, then the next thing that I'll use to work on with my patients is just have them focus on getting 100 grams of protein per day. For some people, this still might sound like a lot, but it's a lot easier if we break it up over three meals and focus on getting about 30 or so grams per meal. Some examples of 30 grams of protein is about three to four ounces of chicken breast, four ounces of sirloin steak, five ounces of cooked shrimp, and five to six eggs. By including a little protein with each meal, it makes it a much easier goal to achieve. Something I did wanna mention and something you might be wondering about is all the examples I just listed are all animal-based foods. And you might be curious if it's okay to do some sort of protein shake. Well, I'm not against protein powders as long as they fit with your body and don't cause any sort of food reactions. I think they're better as a supplement rather than as a replacement. Whole protein does a better job of providing long-term satiety and stable energy for the body. And we don't get that with liquid protein versions. So if you're someone who has a sensitive gut or needs another way to add some extra protein to your diet, then sure, protein powders can be a good option. But just like with anything, in general, we want to opt for the whole food choice. And finally, if someone is still feeling overwhelmed, and even though I think they might benefit from higher levels of protein, it really doesn't help us out if there's so much overwhelm that it leads to inaction. For these people, I don't give them some big overarching goal or a target amount. Instead, I encourage them to make small swaps throughout the day that slowly moves them towards a higher protein intake. Instead of cereal or oatmeal for breakfast, maybe we swap that for bacon and eggs. And instead of a plain salad at lunch, maybe we add some extra chicken and even some shrimp. It's little changes like that that can feel a bit more accessible and give us some initial wins that can encourage the person to continue making changes. As we've said before, we're all at different stages in our health journey. And although we wanna make changes that lead to good outcomes and benefits, we also have to make changes that fit where we're at in our life and are sustainable for us long-term. But even if you are nervous and you're just starting to make some of those initial changes, keep pushing yourself and keep progressing. I hope this video has helped you to understand that Hashimoto's leads to a higher demand for protein. And the closer that we can get to your ideal protein intake, the better we can support your thyroid, the better we can support your metabolism, and the better outcomes we can see in terms of weight loss. But what did you think about today's topic? Did you learn some new things? And have you been working on increasing your protein to help support your thyroid function? Let me know in the comments and we can keep chatting about it. Also, if you liked the information and felt like it was helpful, but feel like you need some additional support, then you can send me an email at contact at seattlethyroidhelp.com if you wanna work with me one-on-one. -on -one. Once we receive your email, my staff will reach out to you and they can set you up with a free consultation. During the consultation, we'll take a brief history, learn a little bit more about you, and see if this is something that I can help you with. We always wanna make sure that things are the right fit for you and that you have all your questions answered. So as I said, if you're interested in the consultation or if you have any questions, you can send me an email and you can find that address in the description box below. Finally, if you're looking to learn more and wanna work on some things at home, then the other thing that you can find in the description box is links to some of my free downloads. These include some of the dietary frameworks that I use for a lot of my Hashimoto's patients and also my electrolyte recommendations for people who are looking to use a low carb or ketogenic way of eating. Again, those are free, so check them out and let me know what you think. But that's all I got for you guys today. Thanks for hanging out. If you liked the video, give it a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, follow me on social media, either Instagram or Facebook for daily tips, strategies, and recommendations. And if you have any questions, you're always welcome to reach out. My name is Dr. Rabotel. I hope that you guys have a great week and I'll see you in the next one.